Nancy, is that coming through okay? Um, I'm a board member until the 25th of April, which is when SES has their annual general meeting. And hopefully I'll get reelected to be on the board again. So if you uh, would like to come out and participate in the AGM, I think uh, it's a week from tonight, is that right? Um, so thank you to Katya and uh, Nancy and the volunteers who put on this speaker series. I'm uh, delighted to be speaking at it. I've seen a lot of really great talks, so hopefully I can keep your attention and keep you awake with my talk tonight. I don't, <clears throat> it's tough for me to identify as a farmer or identify as a lawyer, but um, I do try and practice farming. I didn't grow up on a farm. I'm a city kid, I suppose, but uh, I'll share you with, my, with you my opinion nevertheless. <clears throat> So just as an overview for my talk tonight, I'm going to talk about why I think we need to focus on sustainability, the impact of our food system on our environment, on the climate, what farmers can do, and then I'll talk a little bit about legal challenges and uh, aspects of liability. Now just as any lawyer would like to do is a disclaimer here, so these, I'm going to present, present some information and try and give you some credited sources of where I got that information. But these opinions I present here are my own and I will also freely admit that the more I read and the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And so I can't promise you any answers, but I will give you my uh, opinions after I can promise you I've had a lot of deep thought about many of these ideas. and. So many of our beliefs are so closely held that we are often not willing to consider other people's you know, perspective or opinion. I see that all the time with respect to energy or with respect to food, and some people are very focused on you know, being vegetarian, for instance, and uh, I think it's wise for all of us to just always have an open mind and just think about, you know, sometimes there is more than one right answer, I suppose, right? So the first thing I want to say is, uh, I can't sugarcoat the situation, but we are honestly in big trouble. And um, the more I've read about this situation that we're, that we're faced with, the more it causes me great anxiety. I lose sleep over what's happening. I have lost the ability to enjoy many of the things that I would consider to be pastimes. I have focused the last more than a decade of my career to have this sole focus and vision on just trying to influence others and accelerate the necessary transition to sustainability. And it has caused me a lot of emotional and mental health problems. And uh, I, I guess the one thing I would like to try and inspire or motivate you with my talk is I'm, I'm making an appeal to you for help because I feel like I've been doing an awful lot of heavy lifting and that I don't have you know, the endurance to keep it up forever. It's very much unsustainable what I've been doing in my own life. Mm -hmm. But um, I view the situation to be so urgent that we need to act. And I can't break myself away from that no matter how hard I try. But what I need from you in this appeal here is, is I've come to realize that no one can do it all despite how much I've tried and how much I've broken myself to try and do this. But Everyone's got to do something and so I'm urging all of you if you're listening to my talk if I can have any impact on you whatsoever It is that I hope that it will inspire you to do more And it doesn't mean that you have to do something huge or heroic But even the simple act of talking to your neighbors normalizing the discussion about the situation we're in and uh, and trying to inspire change because I look around every day and I, I see people just acting as though there's nothing wrong and, and that this thing that we see as normal is, is acceptable and, and it's not. And I'm just hoping that you will join me in trying to endeavor to do more. And so I've tried to break down what we need to do into three points, you know, <clears throat> a simple plan that would, that would appeal broadly to solve most of our problems, including sustainability with respect to food. And I think it needs to be a tweak on the old three R. We used to hear about reduce, reuse, recycle. It was embedded into everybody's mind in the 1980s or so. I would tweak those three R's to say that the number one priority that we have to embark upon is reducing our impact. And so that means reducing waste, it means being more efficient, it means ending this consumer culture that is just meant to drive this fictitious thing called the economy. So reducing our impact has to be number one. The second R would be replacing fossil energy with clean energy. And the third item is reconciling our relationships. 
not only with each other, but also with nature. So I don't probably need to dwell on this with this crowd. You guys are part of the sustainable, or the Saskatoon Environmental Society gang. We know about climate change. I would encourage you to go check out this Climate Atlas um, website where you can plunk in any city and see what the effects of climate change are going to be. But I want to emphasize what Antoni Antonio Guterres said at COP27, and that is that we are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Mm -hmm. And we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. And why is our uh, foot still on the accelerator? And it's, it's because governments like Saskatchewan, we are still planning growth. Growth in an economy based on dirty energy and in unsustainable um, you know, ways, ways that are going to harm us. So I want to talk just a little bit about the three greenhouse gases that agriculture is responsible for, has an impact on, and those are CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide. So the nitrous oxide one comes primarily from, associated with nitrogen fertilizer. Um, but the big difference I want to focus on here is the difference between CO2 and methane. Now, I want you to think about CO2 as a forever chemical or a forever greenhouse gas component because when it is emitted, it is a cumulative effect. So it's, it's like the bathtub that two presentations ago, Brett Dolter was here and he talked about CO2 being like a bathtub, that we're adding water to that bathtub. And so there's a cumulative effect to CO2, meaning that the emissions that you cause you know, when I took my kids to Disney World, when I thought that was a smart thing to do in 2014, those emissions from our plane ride there are still going to be impacting and causing climate change forever. Methane, on the other hand, is a temporary greenhouse gas. So it's like there's a plug pulled out of the bathtub at the bottom and it's constantly running out. And so when you change the rate of methane being added to the environment, you can actually, like if we were to drop the methane rate and, but still be emitting methane, we would actually see a response in that there would be a decreased amount of, of global warming because methane is so short-lived in the atmosphere. So that's the difference. And I'm only raising that because so many people focus on cattle and livestock as being the huge problem that are in our food system are, are causing our climate crisis. But I view that to be partly a distraction of the oil industry trying to take the focus off of them and put it on others. This plot here at the bottom right of the screen is from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And even there you can see that natural gas and petroleum systems are responsible for about a third, if you include the coal mining, it's more than that. So about a th more than a third of the, the uh, methane emissions, because this is only about methane here in this bottom corner, more than a third come from oil and gas. And so the livestock component and manure management, um, it's slightly less than that. But constantly we see um, the oil industry focusing on cattle. And just to emphasize this need to transition though, if, if we think of the Paris Agreement and the carbon budgets that remain, so the two, uh, the two bars on the right hand side here are showing the carbon budgets remaining and the left <coughs> bar is showing fossil fuel reserves that are already in development. So if we continue to extract all those already developed fossil fuel reserves, we will exceed the carbon budget in the atmosphere. We will go past what we agreed to in Paris by a wide margin. So that's the reason why I say that we don't need to be expanding fossil fuel generation or fossil fuel um, energy. There simply is no room in the carbon budget for it. And that's why Antonio Guterres says we're on the highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. Governments like Canada, and you can see Japan and Korea, this is a plot showing uh, how many dollars are devoted to fossil fuel subsidies. So Canada is still accelerating the causes of climate change. This is taxpayer funded climate change. Even though Canada committed in 2009 to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, there's been no progress to date. So this to me is shameful and needs to be addressed. And then I'm saying, I'm talking about this though because at the end of the presentation we talked about liability. It's, it's important for us to realize Canada, you know, we have a lot to answer for. And when you think about the cumulative carbon emissions per capita on this slide, Canada is one of the worst offenders. So if liability does, ever does come home to roost, 
we're talking about having a large bill to pay in terms of you know our country and the cumulative emissions we've caused. So let's move more into sustainability in general and also I'll tie this into agriculture. So the Stockholm Resiliency Center in Sweden, they came up with this idea about the planetary boundaries. And so you can see this plat this chart is showing several different planetary boundaries that they've identified. Um, and the green space in the middle is sort of the living within the means of the planet's capability. The areas that are in the yellow and the red, this is where human humanity or our, our human enterprise has exceeded the planetary boundaries, the ability of the planet to assimilate or, or manage what we are doing to it. And you can see climate change is, is the the one at the top, just sort of in the one o'clock position there on the clock. Um, it's not actually the worst offender as far as the Stockholm Resilience Center. They, they found actually the biosphere integrity, which is say the 11 o'clock position there, is most at risk for us right now. So this is talking about the extinction rate, the, the amount of species that are becoming extinct every year. We are accelerating the sixth mass extinction, extinction event on the, in the history of the planet. But the other things that are in the red is down in the bottom, say in the, I guess it'd be about the seven o'clock position there on that uh, diagram. So those are the biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so nitrogen and phosphorus is directly tied to our human agriculture. So we are now putting more nitrogen into the, the geochemical flow on the planet than, than the planet has ever experienced before. And these folks at the Stockholm Resilience, Resiliency Center are, are you know, raising the red flag alarm that this is also not sustainable, nitrogen and phosphorus flows that we are, that we are manipulating with our industrial agriculture. So in, in general, the impact of our food system, it's not just the simple growing of food or the raising of livestock. Our whole food system now is dependent on cheap energy and fossil fuels to run that system, to transport the food, to refrigerate, to process the food. So it's all of these things, growing, transportation, processing. Processing is often done to, to also add to the shelf life of food. But in that same act, we also often reduce the nutritional uh, qualities of the food. So highly processed food is, is one of the things that our industrial food system has come to rely on. Not only to add shelf life, but to be able to transport it further and often to make it um, sometimes more addictive and, and tasteful to people, I suppose. But the food value in highly processed Cheetos and uh, soft drinks is dubious at best. In addition though to the processing of distribution of food through transportation, often relying on fossil fuel based transportation infrastructure, Refrigeration of food, often again relying on electricity coming from grids that are heavily relying on natural gas and coal-fired generation. But then we also prepare, consume the food, and then we dispose of it at home, often with a lot of food waste. So in reality, about a third of all of our global greenhouse gas emissions are linked to our food systems. And there's a reference for where that, that uh, fact comes from there. I want to really focus in though on the United Nations Environmental Program's GAP report. So they look at emissions for all sectors in this, this GAP report that they prepare. And so I'm looking only specifically at the food uh, sector. And so this plot is showing the change in emissions related to our food system from the first uh, decade of this century to the second decade and showing the changes. But you can see on this graph that uh, the, they've got it on the left hand side categorized into three separate areas. So one is called land use and land use change. That's the L-U-L-U-C, land use and land use change. And then the middle section is what we would all kind of identify or recognize as farming, you know, in the, the generally accepted practice of farming, agriculture. So this is, this is the primary production on the farm. And then the supply chain is referring to all of that other stuff that's related to processing, transportation, refrigeration, and so on. And so you can see the farm component, the stuff that's happening on the farm is probably less than a third of the total emissions in, the, in our whole food system. So also in the GAP report, there was suggestions of how we could reduce our emissions associated with our food system. And this is showing how to get to the target of the, the two degree Paris Agreement uh, emissions reductions that, we, that they think we need for our food system. 
And on the left is showing uh, projected emissions from our global food system if we were just to follow business as usual practices. So again, that, that section that says farm level improvements, that's what's happening right at the farm. And you can see that's relatively, it's only about a quarter of the total emissions reductions that we're looking for. The UN gap report here is suggesting most of the reductions are gonna come on the demand side changes. And so this is speculating that we're gonna be able to convince most people to adopt flexitarian, pescatarian, vegetarian, and vegan diets. Um, the section here that shows the uh, reduction in waste, I don't think it's, it's called out as well on this slide. It was on the one prior, but it's not as large as, as you would expect it to be. The main thing to recognize here is that demand side changes, changes is what they're largely going to say is the largest uh, impact on reducing our food emissions. But it's not huge. I think decarbonizing the supply chain is, is as big as the number of people they expect to go to vegan diets. And I think it's actually more, from my perspective as an engineer, I think it's easier to, to change the big system and move from a decarbonized supply chain and is to convince everybody who may not want to go vegan to become a vegan. So I wanna go back to this methane issue just briefly here because I know that there's a lot of facts out there about how ruminant livestock are a significant source of methane emission, and that is true. In fact, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization suggests that all domestic livestock on the planet are responsible for about 14% of our greenhouse gas emissions. But again, I view this as a distraction technique from the oil industry trying to say, we're not the problem, it's, it's cows. And I know that there are, there's research ongoing right now to adjust the diet. If you carefully control the diet being fed to ruminant animals like cows, there's, there's preliminary research that's showing we can already reduce the methane coming from cows in their, in their ruminant digestion. But cows also play an important role in grassland ecosystems, and I don't think many people respect that. And I mean, the grasslands evolved with buffalo roaming on there, and, and there's a whole biodiversity you know, ecosystem interaction that cannot be ignored. And so I, I, I've been reluctant to, uh, you know, I've dedicated the rest of, or most of my life in the last 10 years to this, this trying to reduce my impact. I've never been convinced of the uh, legitimacy of switching to a vegan diet, because as a farmer, I know that a lot of the food that, that isn't fit for human consumption, especially if I have grain that's either heated, or, uh, you know, if you've got uh, contamination, let's say you've got mixed grain, if your oats aren't, devoid of wheat or, or barley in there, they won't be gluten-free, and so they won't want them for general meals to make Cheerios. And so cattle are actually, a, and all livestock are actually very efficient at taking waste products that we would otherwise just throw away and turning it into protein that we can eat. So I'm not suggesting that we need to grow more cattle. It's probably likely that our livestock um, herd might decrease somewhat, but I don't think eliminating cattle is necessarily it's not the lowest hanging fruit for me in terms of climate action. I think the, the natural gas and the oil and gas industry are far mm -hmm. bigger um, you know, fruit or far bigger fish, I should say, to go after. And what really troubles me actually is that the methane emissions from most of these oil and gas companies have actually been underreported. And so these are just some headlines from just articles in the last year talking about how the methane emissions, fugitive emissions from oil and gas sites are nearly four times higher than reported in Saskatchewan. And so this tells me that the situation with, with livestock is probably far less of an impact than what we're seeing with our oil and gas production. So trying to get back a bit to agriculture and our path forward and our food systems, this is Canada's pathway. This is Canada's plan to reduce emissions by 2030. Now, the big bars on the top, the ones that are the most responsible for our emissions right now are transportation and oil and gas. And so when you think about oil and gas, this is our oil and gas production and export. Those exports of oil and gas, though, are generally burned in someone else's transportation in another country. So this is, to me, underlining how important it is to electrify our transportation. Because if we can electrify it and we can produce it with zero emissions, that would take those top two lines and remove them very quickly. Agriculture and land use and, for, uh, land, use and land use change, nature-based climate solutions and agriculture is the very bottom line. 
And the very bottom bar there, what's interesting about it is you see it starts to dip below zero. Mm -hmm. It goes below the zero axis. And so the federal government is expecting that we're going to have some negative emissions from agriculture, nature-based climate solutions, and land use changes. Generally, this will be either reforestation, afforestation, or um, there's been a lot of talk about how soils in Saskatchewan are sequestering carbon now because we've gone to zero till. And uh, the one thing I want to caution you about, though, is that I don't believe that this zero till carbon sequestration can go on forever because of equilibrium chemistry. And so it, it seems folly to me to expect that we can take all of this ancient uh, hydrocarbons that have been stored in, in geological storage in the lithosphere, burn them, and then expect our soil to just be able to sequester all of that at the top six or 12 inches of, of, of ground. I just I find that to be preposterous. So I'm, 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 I guess, a little bit nervous about this bottom line and it dipping below zero. And the other thing I would encourage you to do is uh, look up a, there's a new report out called, um, oh shoot, I'm losing the name of it now, but essentially they were doing a, a study on the amount of land that it's going to take to sequester all of this carbon. So many countries now are making pledges to reduce their emissions and they're depending on this, this the idea of net zero being offset with sequestration. Mm -hmm. But it takes a certain amount of land to do that sequestration, either through photosynthesis and trees or what have you, right? If you're gonna use the land to sequester carbon, it's not clear to me that we'll be able to still produce food from it that we need to feed the world's population. So I'm, I'm always hesitant to believe these numbers about this negative uh, sequestration, especially when I think the land, is that right? The presentation I went to was called Mind the Gap, and I'll have to find the name for you, but I think it's called land, landgap.org. But in there, they clearly show the, the, the commitments by many different countries. Some countries are actually committing to sequester more carbon than they even have in terms of land base. Some are 200%. So it, it's just, it's not possible, right? So this is where I think there always has to be some sort of you know, careful consideration of the legitimacy of what some, mm -hmm. what some people are uh, pledging to do. Um, I want to give one little last sort of uh, glimmer of hope, I suppose, before I move directly into agriculture, but we have to act in the next five to six years. If we don't make significant changes by 2030, I fear that we're in big trouble. But thankfully, there is a lot of technology that is hitting tipping points this decade. So this is from a presentation that was done by the Rocky Mountain Institute in October of 2022. And so electricity is already past the tipping point. It's now more cost effective in many places to build new solar and wind electrical generation assets than it is to fire existing coal fired or natural gas fired generation. So that means to me electricity is past the tipping point. It is now cheaper to build clean electricity, which is fantastic. Cars, you look here around 2025, they're just going to say it's passing the tipping point of the niche market to the mass market. We, we can all see that happening now. You've probably all seen elect ads on television for electric cars. It's becoming more normalized. That's just the second example, but all of these sectors here are going to pass through tipping points in this decade. So we've got buildings, trucking, aviation, shipping, steel, cement, and chemicals. This is essentially going to mean the demand for fossil fuel has probably peaked already and is likely already falling. I think that in agriculture, we rely a lot on diesel fuel to run our farms here, especially in Western Canada. We will probably be the last to convert to clean energy. That energy may be hydrogen produced by electrolysis, or it may be electrification and, and batteries. We don't know yet, but we know it's coming. I expect we will largely in agriculture follow the trucking industry, because trucking requires the same, the same kind of large horsepower, long hours, and, and you know that once that reliability is proved in the heavy trucking industry, it won't be very long before it transitions into agriculture. So this is kind of a changing point in my presentation here. I want to talk now what I think farmers can do. And to me, it's about reducing emissions and inputs, but how? And so I'm going to talk a little bit just about what we've done personally on our farm with our farmhouse and also with our farming practices. So this is our farmhouse where we 
decided to do a deep insulation retrofit. And so I actually have more uh, positive memories and feelings about the summer we spent doing this with my family than I do about our trip to Disneyland. <laughs> I think the Disneyland trip actually cemented for me that I was going to dedicate the rest of my career to climate action because that whole consumption mess it still gives me nightmares. Um, so I taught my son how to operate this excavator. I said it's just like a video game and he actually excavated all the way around the house so that we could install uh, this six inches of styrofoam against the concrete. Um, then we ended up building walls on the outside of the house. So the walls are now 17 inches thick. We removed our natural gas in 2008, so we were already heating with geothermal by this time. But I figured that we save enough energy now just on our house to allow us to drive our cars about 27,000 kilometers a year, our electric cars, right? So the energy savings, the ability to heat your house without natural gas, we are proof positive that it is ready now and has been ready actually for probably a decade. So the things that we've done in our house, we've, we put solar panels up, we've been driving electric cars, we did this insulation retrofit. I estimate that we are saving about $6,000 a year in fossil fuel energy that we used to buy. We are saving probably in the neighborhood of around 10 metric tons of pollution per year. But when I think about what I'm doing in the field, there's a much bigger lever for me to pull with, with 800 acres or so. I'm not a big farm, but when we're thinking about what we do in, in an industrial scale on you know, our industrial farming practices, even though we're a small farm, when you go to the farm input store and buy a truckload of fertilizer, the embodied emissions of that fertilizer is huge. And so when we switched to minimum input farming, I think we were reducing our, we were already fairly low input, I would say, right from the start. I have never been a guy that pours on a whole lot of inputs to our farmland. But um, I would say we generally save about 50 to $100 per acre in less inputs. But when I think about the amount of emissions associated with, you know, the tons of fertilizer that we would apply, or the tons of herbicides, or pesticides, or fungicides, I estimate that our emission savings just on our small farm are more than 50 metric tons per year. And we're not organic, we're not you know, using no inputs, we're just very judiciously using as little as we think is, is reasonable. And I learned how to do that from the National Farmers Union. So I would encourage you, if you do wanna read about it, they have a lot of free publications there. One of the first ones that I read was called Tackling the Farm Crisis and the Climate Crisis. And that report is about four years old now, but still really well worth the read. So to me, minimum inputs on the farm means less of this, which is, you can see here, truckloads of anhydrous ammonia going to this anhydrous ammonia storage tank. And in this bottom picture here, this is the farm input store where I would go to pick up case loads of chemical or, you know, my canola seed that's coated in um, neonicotinoid. Less of that and you know, moving away from those chemical and uh, emissions intensive inputs and instead moving to getting most of those things from biology. So at the top here on this slide, I'm showing that farming, in my opinion, has already gone through two agricultural revolutions. The first was mechanization. So moving away from, you know, doing everything by hand or horses to diesel fuel and machines. The second revolution was chemistry where we incorporated the Haber-Bosch process and made nitrogen from natural gas, and we started to get really good with understanding herbicides and pesticides. The third revolution that's just starting now, in my opinion, is biology. And so I think we're gonna see a lot more uh, in terms of intercropping and recognizing the benefits of, of biodiversity in the field rather than monoculture crops. But there's also a lot happening in the biotech field, and. Um, I know many people are, are wary about genetically modified food, some for human health issues, other people just worried about biodiversity in, in, the, in the ecosphere in general. My worry is more about control, and if uh, we have private ownership of this intellectual property, I worry that it will be exploited for profit and not managed in you know, a more holistic way to do what is best for the environment and for humans. But it is foreseeable to me that we may someday have wheat or oats that is perennial so that you only need to seed it once and might be able to harvest it for 10 years or something of that nature. We, 
I know that there's research going on to try and produce uh, cereal crops that can fix their own nitrogen. So if you had that, you would be, perhaps be able to grow crops without having to apply nitrogen. But rather than try those, those new technologies that may or may not come to pass, what we've been trying to do on our farm is doing a lot more of intercropping. And intercropping because if we grow more than one species on the field at the same time, um, I've been sort of led, led to believe from my own experience that it gives us I think a better, more efficient use of what's there. When there's, when there's only one species growing on the surface, you have a much less diversity in the soil. And so if you have multiple species growing on the surface, you're more likely to have more biodiversity in the soil in terms of fungi and bacteria and microbes. And that broader diversity in the soil is gonna be able to turn that mineralized organic matter into bioavailable uh, nutrients for the plants to take up. The thing I should point out on this slide before I advance here, though, is that what's in the red box here, this is uh, something I saw at the um, Saskatchewan Soil Conservation Conference about uh, a year and a half ago. But so in agro systems, or agro ecosystems, sorry, global fertilizer nitrogen use efficiency remains stubbornly low at around 40% and must nearly double by 2050 to meet predicted food and environmental demands. That's another reason why I've been focused on, on minimizing my inputs because it just seemed like a waste to me that if we're only having use efficiencies in the 40%, why would I want to put on a whole lot of inputs if I'm only getting 40% of it, right? Well, just before, on that slide, sorry for interrupting, but you have several acronyms down at the bottom there, S-O-N, M-A-O-M. Could you just uh, quickly tell us what those are? Uh, mineral Associated Organic Matter, I think particulate organic matter. Uh, I can't remember what the S O N. I'd have to look that one up. Sorry, I can't answer that. Soil organic nutrients. Probably yeah. soil organic nutrients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Soil organics. I shamelessly stole this slide or as a screen capture when I was at that Saskatoon or Saskatchewan Soil Conservation uh, Conference. I would highly recommend. Um, going to one of those conferences, because I've, I've learned so much from them, actually. And, and it, again, it expands my mind and realizes once you learn something, you realize how much you don't know. So this is a picture of our intercropping, in one example. We've got canola and lentils growing here, and it's interesting to me that we haven't had a lot of good moisture years in the last three, so they haven't looked, um, the crops haven't looked as good, but it's interesting to me that in places, like we would seed this uniformly with uh, you know, canola and lentils, but it's funny how in the soil in some places the lentils will be a patch where it grows heavy and then there'll be no canola there, but they'll be all similar places where there's lots of canola and no lentils. So I think I can't explain what's happening, but um, to me, I find it quite interesting that by doing this intercropping, the plants behave a bit differently. And so the lentils, when I grew a monoculture crop of lentils, they would generally be fairly low to the ground and they'd be very susceptible to getting uh, fungus. And so you'd have to spray it with fungicide to try and prevent it from molding and so on. When you grow it with canola as an intercrop, first of all, we seed it at a little bit lighter rate. So instead of seeding the canola at five pounds per acre, we're trying to target about three pounds per acre. And then when we're planting the lentils, instead of seeding them normally around a bushel per acre or 60 pounds per acre, we're trying to do about maybe two thirds of a bushel. So what tends to happen though is once the canola bolts, like it, it has kind of a bushy, Plant and then at one point the stalk bolts and it grows really high and then it, it leaps out and provides shade, right? Well, then it makes the lentils try and compete for sunlight. They actually try and grow up and they vine up the canola stalks and they're not on the ground. So the lower plant density and that they're vining up and not laying on the ground, we found that we've never actually had to spray them for fungicide. Hmm. So that, that fungicide application generally has cost about $25 an acre just for the chemical. Yeah. And so I just find that I always felt that I never, it was never a guarantee that you're gonna get enough extra yield to justify the uh, fungicide application. But you also have quality concerns to worry about because if you have more, you know, incidence of fungus that are mold and mildew and fungus growing on your lentils, they're gonna be degraded and you won't get a high, as high a price, right? So there's always this careful, judicious decision that one has to make when you decide what to spray in the crop. 
this is uh, Joel Williams. That's the name of the fellow I wanted to, and he's the person I shamelessly stole that other slide from. But this is another one I stole from him because I just thought it was so com compelling and persuasive to me. When you have this, these two species, there can be some direct transfer of nutrients through their mycorrhizal hyphae. So it's not just that the lentils are gonna fix their own nitrogen and sequester it in the soil and have it ready for next year's crop. Some of it is actually being made bioavailable for the plants that are growing right alongside it. And I didn't, I didn't think that was possible at first, but it seemed, it seemed that my observations and practice and hearing uh, soil scientists like Joel Williams talk about it, it, it does make some sense to me. And so the, uh, the other way he justifies this is he says that when you have more than one species, it actually changes the math. So it, it becomes more like one plus one equals three. And I've seen some other people, especially if they're uh, pasture guys and running animals, where they actually try to target having 10, sometimes even 20 different species of plants growing on their field. And that biodiversity causes, again, a, a much more diverse uh, community of fungi and microbes in the soil, which then leads to the ability to dissolve more of that mineralized associated uh, nutrients and make it bioavailable for the plants. And so that's why he has this one plus one equals three when you start using multiple species in your, in your uh, cash cropping or in your uh, pasture management. So this is just an example of what our combine tank looks like when we are, are combining the lentils and canola together. The only downside I've found with this lentil canola mix is we, we tend to swath it and then if you get any wind, you can be really at risk of the wind blowing your crop away because nobody swaths lentils. They're so light, they just get blown away like nothing. But if you have enough canola there and it's heavy enough, it can hold it down. And the other problem though with this is though, because the lentils don't generally grow very high, you're probably cutting it pretty low so that you don't have a lot of stubble there to hold it down, right? So we'll roll it, but we're only rolling it into, you know, stalks of canola that are only say three to four inches off the ground. So there are risks associated with this, but generally we trade time that we would spend in the sprayer in crop during the growing season. For now we spend the time after post harvest to separate the two seeds so that we can market it. So we've got to always, when we plan our intercrop, we think about can we mechanically separate these seeds afterwards based on size, length, you know, that kind of thing. And so this is an example of what we're doing here now. Instead of spending time in the, in the high clearance or sprayer or the field sprayer, we're spending time after harvest to separate grain. So we've done oats and peas. Um, we tried oats and camelina a little bit. I'm gonna try and expand that maybe this year and canola lentils, canola lentils and alfalfa. Um, I think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of intercropping and we're only just beginning to do this. It's not, I would say, even um, widely accepted in Saskatchewan yet. What, what have you got there, that green, what, what, is, what is that green apparatus there? So that's a, called a quick, quick clean uh, grain separator. Right. So it's basically seven screens that are, I think it's a number nine round hole mm -hmm. uh, sieve screen that we've got there. and so. The lentils get augered up through it and then they come out at this end and so this one auger that's coming off here is taking the lentils. The small auger going up, that's a, about a four inch auger, that's actually what controls the rate. That's canola going up there into the truck. So this is splitting the canola and lentils. Right there, the other, right in the truck. Yeah, the other downside to this, I suppose, the last three years have been pretty dry for us and so our lentils have been too dry and then we run the risk of them splitting and, and chipping when they're being handled so much. Um, but generally, you know, if we've had years where it's what I would call normal moisture, if we get the lentils off, but you know, right at the borderline where they're tough to dry, like if they're around 14 or 15% moisture, that's fine by me. And then they don't split or give nearly as much trouble. The last few years we've been, you know, less than 12% moisture on our lentils, which to me is really dry for, the, for that crop. So how quick is quick clean? Uh, well, I would say we can put about um, 450 bushels per hour of canola. So depending on the crop, like if, if there was say a 50-50 split, if it was 50% canola and 50% lentils, we'd probably put 900 bushels an hour through that machine. But if it, if it gets down to the point where there's uh, say only 30% canola and 
70% lentils, then you can push a lot more through because it's the small lager that is our rate determining factor. Because once it gets overcrowded with canola, then it starts backing up in the machine and then you, you got to cut your feed rate down or you're going to have canola passing through into your lentils you don't want that. It's just a loss because any canola that goes up with the lentils will only be treated as dockage at that elevator, right? And canola, I don't have to tell you how much canola has in terms of value nowadays, so if you want to save every one of those seeds, you can. Okay, so how am I doing for time? I was going to, I got about four slides on legal aspects. Is that okay? I think what we're going to start seeing happen in terms of uh, using the legal system, there's no doubt in my mind, I should say, first of all, that using the courts to pursue climate litigation is accelerating and accelerating in a big way all around the world. Um, but the one thing that's interesting to me is when we were at COP26, my wife and I went as part of an observer delegation of the National Farmers Union, and there was a lot of talk about loss and damage at that COP conference. And the more I've thought about this afterwards, loss and damage, these are masking words for what is really liability and compensation. And most countries do not want to talk about liability and compensation because that essentially means we have to pay for our wrongs, right? Um, but I think that it's probably going to happen someday. And I think it would be wise for us, it would be prudent for us to be making as many changes as we can, as quickly as we can, so that we can limit our exposure to that liability and our, our obligation to provide that compensation. I should also explain with the two words, loss and damage, just briefly. So when we've lost something, it's, it's sort of like a family member has died. It's, it's lost, it's gone, right? It's never coming back. That's a species that has gone extinct. Damage, though, on the other hand, implies something that you can compensate for or that you could remedy, right? You might be able to recover and, and overcome that damage. Often that happens through compensation. But the thing that's interesting from my perspective is that this idea of attribution science, it's, it's growing, it's, it's becoming more and more precise. So attribution science is, is about trying to attribute a certain amount of the global emissions that cause climate change to specific entities, whether that is Imperial Oil or Suncor or Synovus Energy. It's becoming more and more common. And this court case that's here, this is a, a Peruvian farmer who tried to sue the German electricity producer in nuisance for 0.5% of the cost of their flood protection that that town or city had to implement because of this glacier, this mountain glacier that was, it was just becoming flooded and over, overrunning and, and damaging this town. That court case is still ongoing. I don't know the result of it yet, but it was interesting to me. They were grounding it in this attribution science saying, we know that RWE is responsible for 0.5% of global climate change to date based on their historic cumulative emissions. <clears throat> And so that's why this idea of cumulative emissions and filling the bathtub that I talked about, that's, that's what worries me about Canada and our cumulative emissions on a per capita basis. We could become liable at some point. From a legal perspective, suing companies is, uh, is possible, but companies can go bankrupt, right? And then they cease to exist and it's hard to get blood from a stone. But governments aren't the same way, right? It's very rare that you see a government go bankrupt imagine that's the people there that will be suffering the most, right? Because we'll have to make amends or, or face the consequences of our emissions. So there's this other idea I've got here in terms of, you know, you ought to have known. So this is the difference between willful blindness and negligence. It's, it's becoming more and more clear that the carbon majors have had knowledge that their products cause adverse impacts on the environment. And we've also seen evidence now that carbon majors have been engaged in this willful obfuscation of climate science. Now, just last month, there was a, a journal article published in the Harvard Law Review. So this is a reputable in academic magazine. They were talking about the possibility of, of pursuing some big oil companies for what they're calling climate homicide, that they're willfully causing deaths of humans for their actions. I don't know that that would happen in Canada. It's very likely that the prosecutor would stay the charges or not pursue the case, but 
This is just one example of how our, our collective culture is changing in, in terms of what we think is acceptable or even possible. And as more and more people, I think, get more and more frustrated with what they see as this willful obfuscation and this willful blindness, I think there are likely to be consequences. So the problems, though, with the, even though legal actions are accelerating, which is, is great news, I mean, it's, it's, it's doing what the, the legislative branches of our government have failed to do. It's the judicial system now that's being called upon to try and hold people to account. The problem with all of these things is it's way too slow. It can take mm -hmm. decades for this to happen. And we are in a climate emergency. We need to act as though our house is on fire. And I don't know that we can depend on our legal system in the next five to six years to deliver what we need. The other thing is there's a lot of uncertainty with what the judge is going to order when they do finally hear the case on its merits. We don't know what might ever come in each of these cases. And the last thing I would say is the cost of it. Who has the money to pursue these kind of actions? Because often it's volunteers who don't have the resources. And once you do file a case, you are up against the awesome power of a, a giant company with deep pockets or the government who will throw their whole host of staff lawyers and bury you in paperwork. So that's why I think there's been so, you know, such hesitation for people to try and come forward and do these things because it takes courage, persistence, and, and a hell of a lot of commitment. And an example though is this Drax power plant in uh, the UK. The Drax power plant is a huge power plant that actually produces as much power as all of Saskatchewan. So it's about four gigawatts. And they have plans to convert from a coal-fired power plant to a gas-fired system. And there was a court challenge. And that court challenge delayed and, and stopped this process for about two years. But in the end, it sort of spooked the Drax people and they instead decided to switch to biomass. Now, unfortunately, this has been another loophole in the, in the whole um, emissions reporting thing is I, I don't think it's actually the best um, circumstance that we're now chopping down a bunch of trees and tr turning them into wood pellets and then boating them all the way from Vancouver over to the UK to burn this power plant. But it did cause them to switch from coal to gas to coal to biomass instead. And they do plan to put carbon capture and sequestration on this plant, which if they do, could potentially make uh, negative emissions electricity. The only unfortunate thing here is I think it's not sustainable to be trucking the wood products across an ocean to this plant. It would probably be better to run a Bex plant somewhere closer to your biomass supply. So that's just one example of the unintended, uncertain consequences that can happen with litigation. Now in Canada, we've had about uh, five, um, well, actually in the last few years, there's been four uh, really key climate litigation pieces that have gone forward. Only one of these four, and so that's Envir Environnement Jeunesse, was a class action case in, in Quebec. Uh, it was struck down on, on uh, non-justiciability and it wasn't suitable for a class action. La Rose was also struck down before it could be heard on its merits. And uh, same thing with the next one. The only one that has been heard on its merits, where the, like, and that's when I say heard on its merits, I mean going past a preliminary motion to strike, so that it was actually a full hearing based on everything the parties wanted to put in front of the judge. So that Mather case was heard in September of 2022. The decision just came out last Friday. I haven't read the whole decision yet. I've seen some highlights of it, but it was unfortunately not the result we were looking for in terms of climate litigation. But the judge did make some comments about how it is possible to um, ascribe positive rights to the charter. So we are going to try and look at that case carefully and, and work it into our arguments for our case, which I'll mention here in a minute. Um, but just finishing up on the, the Mather case here, um, it, this is what's happened in Canada. We've had these four cases here in the last three to five years, well, three and a half years, I guess. But international climate litigation is really picking up and is much further ahead than where we are in Canada. Just in 2022 alone, there were 47 new cases in 25 countries, one of them being Russia. Um, so if Russia and Finland are now taking on climate litigation, I mean, it's happening everywhere. And a unique thing that just happened at the United Nations General Assembly was a resolution calling on their International Court of Justice to issue an advisory opinion on climate change. So 120 countries supported that resolution on March the 29th of this year. 
But what I worry about here is, is and I'm not an international law scholar, and so I, these are maybe just opinions with only a little bit of knowledge, but it seems to me that the law that has a much more you know, definite impact is your national law, right? You're, you're, when the Supreme Court of Canada issues a statement or a judgment, Canadians all generally follow that. This International Court of Justice, though, for example, this is only an advisory opinion. So it's more of what I would call a soft law decision in that it can be persuading or influential, but it is not often obligatory for people to follow those judgments. And so that's what worries me about the, the general political narrative we're in these days is we see so many people talking about how, well, the UN are unelected people and it's the World Economic Forum and there's all these conspiracy theories. If we won't, if we won't abide by advisory opinions from an international court of justice, well then how influential will it be? And that's, I think, why you've seen so many more of these climate litigation pieces happening in countries where they are using their own court system to try and get a national decision that, that will guide or direct the uh, legislatures in those countries to respond. And so that's what we're trying to do in Saskatchewan now. Just on the 14th of April, we issued a media um, release to, to go public, I suppose, with our action in Saskatchewan. Some of you may not be aware of this, but myself and a team of uh, about five other lawyers, uh, we organized for the last year, and well, probably almost two years, but certainly a year we've been organizing to pursue an action in Saskatchewan. So we have filed a uh, originating application in the Court of King's Bench in Regina, calling on SAS Power, the Crown Investment Corporation, and on the Saskatchewan government. We're calling them out for their actions to continue to expand natural gas fire generation in Saskatchewan. We believe that that ongoing expansion of new natural gas fire generation violates our charter rights to life, security of person, and equality rights for young people. And so it's for those reasons that we are asking the court to, to hear our application and make a ruling on whether or not our, our charter rights are being violated. Because if they are, we think SAS power should be constrained from building any new uh, unabated natural gas fire generation. And we would further ask the court to direct SAS power to come up with a net zero plan, a plan to decarbonize SAS power by 2035. So that's what we're working on. And uh, so there's a couple of people in the room, if you could raise your hands if you're an applicant in this. I think we've got those two folks there. So if you've got questions, they would also be great people to talk to. So this is my last slide. Um, I want to thank you for hearing me out and I, I do want to go back to what I asked you is please try and dig deep and do more even if it's just talking to your, to your friends and family but um, we have to reduce our impact, we have to replace fossil energy and we have to reconcile our relationships and uh, I, I really think that we have the privilege to know so that gives us a duty to act and, and that's what motivates me. So thank you.